what is trauma? Any brave soul want to give me an example of what they think trauma is? No, no right and wrong answer. Extra cookies. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, you've been studying. <laughs> yeah, the answer was something that threatens the integrity or your safety, physical integrity or emotional integrity or safety. What is interesting is when we first started this work, maybe four years ago, when I would ask people, what is trauma? They would say, oh, um, returning veterans, they got trauma. Uh, rape victims, they've experienced trauma. And I think we've understood a little better what trauma or toxic stress is. And it's really not, not something, not a prescribed event. Because something can be traumatic to one person that another person, it wouldn't affect them at all. So when we're talking about trauma, we are talking about a threat to your physical, or emotional well-being, but it's how it's perceived. Because the body has this whole set of responses, and it doesn't matter if this wouldn't feel traumatic to you. If, that, if it's traumatic to that person, it will start off a whole bunch of neurobiological and physiological responses. It's by nature overwhelming. And because of that, it produces intense feelings of fear and lack of control. And I always ask this question, if you were in a situation where your physical or emotional well-being were threatened and you had no control over that situation, no ability to protect yourself, what do you think, what effect do you think that might have on you as you go forward in your life? in terms of what might you want to do? Any takers? What might you want to do if you'd experienced this lack of control? Be in control, right? And so trauma once again opens the door to our thinking because we have that expression, don't we? Control freak. Maybe we should dig a little deeper. Maybe there's a very good reason that person feels like they always need to be in control. And then it leaves people feeling helpless. And uh, by the way, these are not my definitions. This is Judith Harper from Trauma and Recovery. It changes the way a person understands themselves, the world, and others. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Let's have a show of hands. Who's familiar with the ACEs study? Oh my goodness. Um, yes, everybody in the room practically. So you will know that since this study, we've certainly had a much broader understanding of what is trauma. Perhaps physical abuse, sexual abuse, those kind of things wouldn't have been a surprise to us before. But, for example, one or no parents is considered a traumatic event that has long-lasting physical, mental, and social implications. An incarcerated house, household member. We think about the number of people locked up in this country and the effect that it's having on those households. So I won't, I won't focus too much on this, as I think you're quite familiar, but at ECHO, we love to bring you new stuff. And uh, I, I came across this work by Doug Fields. I don't know if any of you are familiar. He wrote a book called Why We Snap. And what he said is that he's a neurobiologist, and he discovered, oh, I've got Dr. Green's attention now. Um, he said there are nine circuits in the brain that operate independently. And all of these are very primitive wirings that produce this rush of rage. And so Doug Fields talks about this in terms of anger and anger management. But being a trauma person, 
it occurred to me that all of these things are your response to a perceived threat. And what it does is it actually provokes that survival response in you. And we know that, yeah, fighting, anger, is one of the responses. But we also know that it can be flight. And if neither of those work, it could be freeze. So he has this little mnemonic, life morts. And he says, these are the different circuits that produce that feeling of survival rage. The first is danger to your life or limb, basic survival. Somebody comes into your house at night, you're going to react. And actually, this is why he started the work. He was, uh, he was in Barcelona with his 17-year-old daughter, this 55-year-old neurobiologist, and he felt somebody touching his back pocket. And he said, in the next moment, I had this guy in a wrestling lock, and I don't know where that came from. I'm not a Tai Chi expert or anything. It just happened. It was this primitive response. And we have that primitive response when we feel that our survival, our physical survival is threatened. And then because we're mammals and we organize ourselves in tribes, social order is very, very important. Because if you're not high up in the social order, that's going to impact your choice of mate and maybe even your access to food. So if we're insulted, that is jeopardizing our place in the social order. And then, any mothers in here? Someone goes for your child, ah! right? Immediate, protecting your family. And then, I don't know if any of you were driving on the freeway and someone cut you up this morning and you got really, really mad. Let me tell you what was happening. That was your territorial sense. And it was a misfire, because the freeway is not really your territory. <laughs> but this primitive circuit of your brain was telling you, someone's intruding on my territory. And then, you'll know this one. If you've ever gone psycho on an ex-lover, or your ex-lover's gone psycho on you, it's all about obtaining and keeping your mate. Again, social order, discuss that. Resources or lack of resources will certainly have an anger response to that. And then this, whether you're one of my tribe or not, it takes us one-tenth of a second for our brain to organize, is this person us or them? So we're talking about very primitive circuitry in the brain, and I'm not saying that we can't override that. But it's good to know what's happening. It's good to know what's happening so that we can override it. So that we can say, OK, that person doesn't look the same as me, but that doesn't mean that they're a threat. And then being trapped in a confined space or restricted in some way. That again, you know, you've heard of animals who gnaw their own pore off in a trap to get out. It's a very primitive response. And uh, way back in my youth, I worked in a mental hospital for children, and the kids were routinely restrained at night. And there was good reason. I mean, there had been incidents that made them do that. But looking at this information made me wonder. What was the long-term effect on those kids? Oh, and then I put this picture in here because inevitably, at our parenting classes, when we ask for examples of when did you last lose it? <laughs> when did you last have a really big conflict with your kid? And uh, for the under five brigade, it's always, ah, oh, I was late for work and I couldn't get them in the car seat. And they're like, You've experienced that, right? Well, let's reframe that. Perhaps that child is just reacting in the way that their brain was, had been programmed to react. Doug Fields, Why We Snap. So I just, I just wanted to throw that in because it's just something I learned recently, and we love uh, keeping things fresh. In addition to 
the ACES questionnaire and the questions about your family of origin. There's been some work recently on adding some other ACEs, which are looking more at community and historical trauma, and realizing that we can't possibly look at people in isolation and not think about things like poverty and homelessness and living in community violence, racism, homophobia, forced separation through immigration, for example. And then there's intergenerational trauma. It just goes on, doesn't it? Again, maybe some things that we wouldn't normally think about. Um, this list surprised me. My grandfather was a prisoner of war for five years um, during the Second World War, and he certainly came back a changed man. But then that makes sense, right? Imprisonment and how that would affect my mother and me and my son. And uh, again, forced displacement. I'm an immigrant, so uh, I kind of get it, what it means when your network of family and friends are not there anymore. But I made a choice. Imagine that you're forced from your country because of war or because of persecution. And so there's a little note at the bottom there that I've written that says, all trauma is intergenerational unless it's healed. Well, what do I mean by that? Firstly, Rachel Yehuda has been doing a lot of work on this. Uh, epigenetics. That just makes me feel good just even saying that. <laughs> epigenetics. And I have a whole slideshow, an ingenious slideshow. I don't have time to show you about that. But basically, the way that our genes get expressed, the genes get turned off and get turned on. And we all know from school and Darwin that it takes a very long time to alter our genetic code. However, how different genes get turned on and turned off, that can, that can change within a couple of generations. And they used to think that it all gets set back to neutral when the baby's born, and now we realize, no, that some of our adaptive behaviors, when we adapt to toxic stress, is actually carried on to our kids. Also, uh, stress in utero. There's supposed to be a protein that protects the embryo from the stress, but if the mother is too stressed, this is no longer working and the cortisol will go across the placenta and affect the baby. And then also stress can be caught. Um, again, I have a whole presentation I could tell you more about this, but basically they've shown that babies respond. When their mother's agitated, the baby's own heartbeat goes up and becomes agitated. And then for an agency that deals mostly with parenting, the, the part that we really address is the attachment part. And intergenerational trauma can cause disruptions in attachment, which we know now is the building block for your future mental and physical health. And if that attachment is disrupted because your, your caregiver is actually the person who's causing the trauma, or your caregiver is so caught up in the trauma in the family that they're not available to you, then that's another way that the cycle continues. And last year we had uh, Bessel van der Kolk, and he, was, he calls this developmental trauma, where trauma meets attachment. If you've not read his book, The Body Keeps the Score, I would highly recommend it. And now the good news. And, and the reason that eco-parenting education is in business, because a safe, stable, nurturing relationship with a caring adult is how kids heal from trauma. And actually, it's how we adults heal from trauma too, if you're lucky enough to find another safe, stable, nurturing adult. When we're talking about taking this into schools, this knowledge, it actually requires us to do things differently and to use the principles of trauma-informed care. There are different versions of this, but I use the Fallow and Harris one. Number one, these are 
pretty much common sense, right? If you've been under physical or emotional safety, the first thing you need to do is to establish safety. Nothing's going to happen. Someone's experienced trauma. If you can't create safety, forget about your cool regulation tools, forget about your cognitive therapy, forget about anything. Because unless that person's feeling safe, they're going to be watching the door, wanting to find a way to escape. Choice. When trauma happens, you have no choice. You're not able to protect yourself. You're not able to control the environment. So giving people choice is really important. And likewise, collaboration. Something was done to you, and now let's try and create an environment where it's not power over, but power with. And likewise, empowerment, giving people back a sense of their own agency. And then the world has been a very unpredictable and untrustworthy place if you've experienced trauma. So we have to build trustworthiness and predictability into all that we do. OK, I'm going to have my little geek session now. The triune brain, three-part brain. When I said that it's really about how trauma is perceived, we can't go around saying, oh, yeah, this is traumatic. This experience isn't traumatic. It's really about how the brain is, is perceiving what's going on. And to best understand that, we conveniently divide the brain into three pieces. If you do a dissection of a brain, you will not find it colored this way, <laughs> nor will you find it grouped in convenient three little part partitions. But I was talking about the survival response, which involves this primitive part of our brain. I say primitive lightly, because when you walked in here, you immediately got a sense of the room. You immediately knew whether you felt comfortable or not, whether you were in danger or not. That is your reptilian brain. And they haven't yet invented a computer who can, that can do that. So you know, primitive said with, with a little dose of salt there. The other area of the brain that we need to be interested in here is the uh, limbic system, the emotional part of the brain. And that's something that we developed as mammals. You know, a reptile lays its eggs, and off they go. A mammal has to take care of their young, because our babies aren't born ready to go. And so that necessitated that we have this whole complex bonding a nurturing impulse from oxytocin. And that's what this part of the brain is all about. And then lastly, the blue part of the brain is the neocortex, which is highly developed in human beings. That's how come we can play video games <laughs> and other interesting and useful things. And then the part of the brain that if you have a child under 15, you're probably not seeing very much evidence of, <laughs> is the prefrontal cortex. And that is what is responsible for our executive functions. And this is a part of the brain that's really important, because when we are feeling under threat, that is the part of the brain that can override that. Remember when I was talking about being cut up on the freeway? And there's a part of your brain that can say, ah, the 405 is not my territory. I can let this go. That's the prefrontal cortex. How many people have that part of their brain online when someone cuts you up? Not many, huh? And, and here's why. We have this little smoke detector in the brain called the amygdala. It sits on top of the reptilian brain. And basically, its whole role in life is to seek out danger. It doesn't care if something nice is happening. Forget that. I just want to find out where the danger is. And so in people who've been traumatized, this actually grows. The amygdala grows. And that's a very sensible, adaptive response from your body, right? I'm in danger. I need to be more aware, more, more hair-triggered so that I can Detect it quickly. And then, again, there isn't really a ladder in your brain. 
This is just a metaphor, okay, a visual metaphor. In case you go back and teach everybody and say, well, Louise said, this is the, the hippocampus is what connects the higher part of your brain. And as educators, this is the part of the brain that we're interested in. Because when this is not online, learning and memory don't happen. And what do we need for learning? We certainly need memory. And what happens is when you're hijacked, when you're in your survival response, we're programmed not to sit there and figure out the logarithm of my escape route versus the, uh, let me see, that's the cosine. So that would mean if I actually took this route, it would take me one millisecond. We don't have time to deal, deal with all that. That's why that part of the brain is not online. And we don't have time to befriend whatever is the danger to us. We just have to get the hell out of there. So when we're in this survival response part of our brain, this upper part of our brain is not on. So forget trying to teach them about the Revolutionary War or the 10 times table. It's not going to happen. And then we were, Annie was talking about these responses, trauma responses. And this is a, it's called the Resiliency Zone. It was developed by Peter Levine and his colleagues. And if you see this black line, this is, this is us in a non-traumatized state. We have our ups and we have our downs, but we stay within the resiliency zone, kind of, sort of. But when trauma happens, then we're all over the place. We get bumped out of the resiliency zone. We get bumped out into hyperactivity, rage, panic, like me when I got blocked in this morning. <laughs> And then we, because the body really is trying to, at any time, create balance, then we go way down the other side, and we get bumped out of the resiliency zone, and that's the shutdown, the exhaustion, fatigue, depression. Does this look familiar? Does this remind you of any of the labels that we use for people and their behaviors. If you were to stick a, a pathology on this, what might you say? Bipolar. Bipolar. So a lot of what we used to think were weird ticks, nature or nurture had caused these weird ticks. We're now understanding this is actually just trauma. So the kid who's standing there with the chair raised over his head about to throw it at you, that could be someone here stuck on high. And now the kid who goes under the radar because they're sitting gazing out of the window and they haven't put a pen to paper the whole time, we used to call them daydreamers. Maybe that's a kid who's here stuck on low. And the other thing, this is courtesy of Heather Forbes, is that when you've had a lot of adverse childhood experiences, you don't have a big window of tolerance. So it doesn't take very much for you to get completely wigged out. That's a scientific term, by the way, wigged <laughs> out. So what we have to do is we have to soothe this reptilian brain there's many ways of doing this. Dr. Bruce Perry talks about rhythmic and repetitive actions. Bruce, uh, Bessel van der Kolk talks about that as well. And if you're interested in knowing what trauma-informed yoga looks like, Hana will be leading a workshop in trauma-informed yoga. And she will be explaining why there are very good physiological reasons when we get dysregulated, why we need to actually activate the dorsal vagal nerve. And there's many different postures and ways of doing that. Also, when we get scared, what do we do? We cling, we huddle. And so if you engage your extensions, extensors, then you trick your body into thinking that, oh, it's okay, everything's okay again. And then the emotional part of the brain, the mammalian part of the brain, Oh, 
My team was working on my slides and they wanted to take this picture out and I said, no, no, you can't do that. Because these are two little babies, true story, two sisters born 12 weeks premature. And this little girl with the green dot on her diaper, she was, she was fading. And the IC nurse kept telling the doctors, I want to put the other sister in the incubator. And they finally let her. And you see what the first thing that little sister did was to put her arm around her. And immediately, the other sister's heart, ba uh, heart rate stabilized, and she got better. Um, this is 1995. These are grown women now. So never underestimate the power of that emotional center, our oxytocin, and what that can do. I still try this with my 20-year-old son, and occasionally he lets me. <laughs> he thinks it's for my benefit. And then lastly, the neocortex. In yoga, they talk about quieting the monkey mind, you know, when you get on that hamster wheel. And there's many different ways of quieting that mind. And when you're working with children, just reading them a story can sometimes help them get out of that loop.